And the conversation this morning is the Ghana Action Series, second edition organized by One Ghana Movement in partnership with the National Commission for Civic Education, NCCE, and 97.3 CTFM. And this morning, the discussion is on the theme, Responsible Citizenship and Accountable Leadership. And just before we came on air, we're trying to sample views on what people think about responsible citizenship and accountable governance. Are we citizens being irresponsible, or is the leadership that is being unaccountable? What are we getting wrong? What is not going right? That's the discussion we are having this morning. The Constitution provides us ample power as citizens and provides the government all the powers that they need to ensure things happen. We shouldn't be discussing issues about lack of foot bridges. I was just saying to a colleague two days ago when I had a minister for highways go to parliament and announce that the N1 highway was going to have three foot bridges. When the foot bridge, I mean, when the N1 was, was constructed, there was talk about having six foot bridges on that N1 highway. It hasn't happened. And now we are having a discussion about the one at Adenta. And then another point that comes up is that even when the foot bridges are constructed, the irresponsible citizens will bypass them. That's also an issue. All right, so we're not just going to put government in a box and hammer them and lock them and throw them in the sea, no. We also have to, as citizens, be responsible. And that is a conversation we are having this morning. And I really appreciate that you have joined us here. And on Facebook, we are very live as well on 97.3 CTFM handle. And of course, One Ghana Movement. On Twitter, you can reach us on One Ghana Movement or at City973. And uh, do keep the conversation coming through. We share it with our uh, various listeners across the world. And of course, here at the British Council Auditorium. So let's do some quick uh, exercise now. Can we please be on our feet and uh, recite the National Pledge? please. And I hope we would be able to remember. I'm going to give the microphone to, we are privileged to have the person who safeguards our constitution for us. So I'll give the microphone to her to lead us uh, in the recitation of the National Pledge. Please, I will not mention her name for now. I promise on my honor. I promise on my honor to be faithful and loyal to Ghana, my motherland. I pledge myself to the service of Ghana with all my heart and with all my strength. I promise to hold in high esteem our heritage won for us through the blood and toil of our fathers. And I pledge myself in all things to uphold and defend the good name of Ghana. So help me God. Thank you very much. Amen. Indeed, that was a prayer. And uh, we really uh, are committing ourselves and we are happy. Now, let's do some quick introductions. So this is a, this is a program outline, generally. We have uh, the discussion ongoing shortly. We will be having an address from our special guest of Anna, uh, who will be giving us a 20-minute speech on the theme that we have chosen for this morning, responsible citizenship and accountable governance. And uh, we'll be asking the question, what are we getting right and what are we not getting uh, right? And who is doing the job right and who is not doing the job right? So quick introductions. Um, of course, we have the chiefs ably represented here. So Name Kenime, I salute you all. Thank you so much for gracing uh, the ceremony. And let me quickly say uh, that this is a, a program put together by One Ghana Movement and 97.3 CTFM and of course with partnership from the National Commission for Civic Education. So let me introduce our chairperson to give us a general overview now. And our chairperson doesn't need a lot of introduction. Uh, Dr. Joyce Aye is a person who is going to be our chairperson for this morning. Please, with a round of applause, let's welcome her. Thank you, Maro. Good morning, once again. Now, how do I begin with this long protocol list? But I've seen some honorables, at least one person here. Uh, so, honorable um, minority leader, 
other members of parliament, if we have any. Nime, Name, Nananum, if there are any. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all other protocols observed. Umaru has started so well, I don't think I need to add much. But I'd like to say that the Ghana Action Series is organized by One Ghana Movement and City FM in partnership with the National Commission for Civic Education. We talk a lot about the failure of government and sometimes the failure of citizenship. But we must find a way of bringing the two together so that we recognize that each of us has a part to play. Interesting that Umaru should talk about the footbridges. Because until we get people to appreciate the fact that the footbridge is meant to be used by pedestrians and not by traders who then block the road and you can't even have access. Until we realize that a highway cannot be crossed like a back street. Until we even realize, I was talking to someone, are Ghanaians afraid of heights? If we are, how do we overcome this? Because the footbridges are high. And for all we know, people are terrified. We may not have thought about it, but it is something to think about. But really, the essence of this action series is that citizens and leaders live together. They live together. We're supposed to make things work for ourselves. That is why we elect one of us to represent us as the leader while we all rally around to make things work. That is how it's supposed to be. And so our presence here is to join together to begin to make things work for us, knowing that Nime, when you go to the chief's court, there's representation of all people. All people are represented. And so it looks as if, you know, every idea, everybody's issues come. Of course, they have the final say. But we should learn, how does the chief relate to his people? So how do we also relate to our people who are leaders? Do we burden them with everything? Are we part of the leadership? Are we part of the leadership so that we can also do our part beyond paying our taxes? Beyond paying our taxes, what do we also do as responsible citizens to make sure that Ghana is one Ghana, not leaders and citizens, but one Ghana. A Ghana which looks forward and not always backwards. A Ghana which has hope for the future and not despair because things are wrong. A Ghana which has a positive attitude because each of us is engaged in ensuring that what needs to be done gets done. That is the reason for our meeting today. So our meeting should focus on the positives as against what we know to be the negative. I, I pray that all of us will have one mind. We've got some very good people to engage in the panel discussions. But our speaker today is excellent as what she does. 
And I'm sure she'll give us a lot of food for thought. We have a duty. You know, even the politician is a citizen first. It's a citizen first. And then takes on the role of being in parliament, of being a minister, or of being the president or vice president or so on. We start off as citizens. Nime are citizens of Ghana, and then they have the additional role. The student leader is a citizen before he takes on or she takes on the additional role. And so the actions that we need to take have to do with the way we think first, what are our attitudes. We need a paradigm shift from what we've seen every day, what we've been doing every day. If what we've been doing every day is not working, then surely there must be another way which works. And today is going to be very interesting because I think we're going to have some discussions. Here, Enumaru, people will call in or something like that, will they? No. Sorry. Just make your comments on your Facebook page or on WhatsApp or whatever it is, and we'll deal with them. So with these few words, I'd like to welcome all of us and to thank you, especially the Nime and Name, for coming. Later on, we'll do some introductions. Umaru, you'll have to do some introductions so that we are on gun soil and we need to know our leaders. You know, you never know. They may decide they will, we will need visas to come to their area. So let's introduce them and let's applaud them for their presence. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you. Oh, you are done. Yes, I have to speak Ghana so that I, I already proved that I'm, I'm qualified and entitled to have a visa. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Joyce Ayeve, for that wonderful introductory remark. And so let me, at this juncture, just quickly acknowledge the presence of representatives of the Greater Accra Regional House of Chiefs. They are ably represented here. Please let's give them a round of applause. Quickly also, the former dean of the Gimpa Law School is in our presence, Mr. Kofi Abochi. Salutations, sir. Now, the executive director of CDD, the Center for Democratic Development, uh, Ghana, H. Professor H. Kwesi Prempe is in our midst. The minority leader in parliament and NDC MP for Tamale South, Alhaji Haruna Idrisu is in our Thank you, yes. And the former Ododudio Member of Parliament, Honorable Jonathan Lee Takikomi. Salutations, sir. Yes. The Executive Secretary of uh, the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association, Giba, uh, Madam Gloria Hiaji. We salute you. Thank you for joining us. And the CEO of Horseman Shoes, Tony Senyaya. Salutations, sir. We'll all get shoes before we leave here. Thank you so much. And students of the University of Ghana who have joined us here, we really appreciate your time. And uh, Mr. Eric Crontin is a head, acting head of governance at the Bank of Ghana. Sir, thank you. Please, are you closing any bank soon? <laughs> Consolidating any bank. Thank you so much. So this is the Ghana Action Series. You're listening to us live on 97.3 CTFM. Um, I am Umar Usanda Amadou. We are broadcasting from the uh, British Council Auditorium, and this is a program put together by one Ghana movement with support from CTFM and the National Commission for Civic Education. We are live on radio on 97.3 CTFM. We are live on Facebook on at CT973. So now to the crux of this morning's discussion. And I'm going to now invite our keynote speaker. And our keynote speaker this morning is someone who abhors vigilantism. She is someone who is not happy. In fact, you can describe her as one of the most active, if not the most active, NCC head ever. Because the National Commission for Civic Education is an institution physically housed at the Electoral Commission premises. They have a small bungalow that they have put them. And so if they don't shout, nobody really hears them. She called a journalist to a press conference and said, I want to talk to you about vigilantism. I do not agree that the NDC should have hawks. And I'm happy that the minority leader is here. So uh, the general secretary of the party endorsed the hawks. I'll ask the minority leader if he also endorses them. And then we do not agree that the NPP should have 
all the boys that they have who have been storming the courts and uh, driving judges away and so on. So you can call her the most active NCCU boss ever and the most civic NCCU boss ever. So I invite, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to the podium, the chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education, uh, Madam Josephine Nkrumah. Please, with a round of applause. Okay, well, I've just been communicated to by my chairperson that before that, uh, we need to hear a quick comment from... Uh, okay, all right, I'll do that, I'll do that, all right. So, so please, let's welcome Madam Josephine Nkrumah, please. Yes. Madam Chair, permit me to adopt your protocols and um, to move on. But I'd like to say good morning to all the distinguished guests seated here and then also to thank the One Ghana Movement for asking NCC to collaborate with them on these um, series, the Ghana Action Series. I think the chairman said it all, what role we should play in ensuring that we move our country forward and ensuring that the transformation that we want in our lifetime, at least in our lifetime, we can see a glimpse of it. So I have chosen to address this subject by speaking to daily activities in our lives that illuminate how our daily lifestyles and activities reflect the concepts of responsible citizenship and accountable leadership. My decision is premised on the objective of the concept paper that I was given. Its final paragraph states, it is hoped that this lecture will provoke a national conversation on the issue of leadership failures at the many levels of our national life, as well as the need for a change of mindset and a collective national reawakening and reorientation in order to march forward. I make references to the 1992 Constitution because, again, my concept paper requires me to review our societal and political challenges within the context of the need to deepen political and constitutional accountability. So this paper will be presented in a very easy manner in all of us to appreciate it and especially for our listening public to understand and appreciate the issues at stake. So I will attempt to address the ideals expressed in our constitution in the context of our everyday lives. But before I delve into definitions and the context within which I choose to adopt, perhaps a detailed reflection of Ghana's political history, which provides a basis that ensures that we regularly interrogate the subject of accountable leadership and the role that responsible citizenship plays. A brief illustration. Perceived poor leadership and governance led to the checkered political history of our coup d'etats interspersed with relatively short spells of democratic governance. As a nation, we witnessed the overthrow of previous republics under Dr. Kwame Nkrumah in 1966, Dr. Kofi Abrefa Buzia in 1972, and Dr. Hila Liman in 1981. As a nation, again, we witnessed the execution of former heads of states because of alleged poor management of the nation and its resources. In all these instances, citizens' involvement and clamor for change was significant. And it is in this regard that the framers of our constitution, when confronted with what preventive mechanisms to adopt in the 1992 constitution against coup d'etats and its resultant overthrow of the constitution, made it a cardinal provision that empowered citizens 
to resist all forms of violence and unlawful means to overthrow the Constitution. Please just refer to Article 3 and its subparagraphs sub of our Constitution. And in fact, to ensure that this provision was well embedded in the psyche of each Ghanaian, Article 231, which establishes the National Commission for Civic Education, has as one of its key mandates to inculcate in Ghanaians the need to defend our Constitution at all times against all forms of abuse and violation. So let me attempt to exp explain what I see the concepts to mean. If the sovereignty of government at all levels resides in the people and government derives all its power from the people, then I posit that by extension, the citizenry are indeed the leaders. And in fact, failed leadership is failed citizenship. I also posit therefore that every leader, and here I mean leadership by election, by appointment, or by natural progression, every leader is first and foremost a citizen. In this regard, I will refer to all of us, whether as leaders or ordinary citizens, as citizen leaders. I also hold the view that the successful implementation of the directive principles of state policy and duties of a citizen as enshrined in our constitution and referred to articles 34 through 41 should be driven by the participation, commitment, and engagement of the citizenry who hold themselves and are held accountable for their actions. In my understanding, the, citizens, the citizen leader's responsibility must use their best skill at all times to serve the best interest of all citizens in order to expand the benefits that every citizen of, citizen of Ghana enjoys and indeed should enjoy. And of course, the citizens' responsibilities are enumerated in Article 41 of our Constitution, and any one of us can refer to it, and it enumerates at least 11 duties of a citizen of Ghana. So for the um, purposes of time, I won't go through all of it. But accountability is being willing to subject yourself to scrutiny at all times within a set framework. Now the choice of these concepts or definitions for myself is premised on the posit of the concept paper alluding to the failure of leadership at all levels in Ghana. So what is it that we are doing at citizen leaders that is failing? What are we doing? I turn to our daily actions, our ethics, our habits, and traits that characterize us as a people in the easiest place that illuminates the intersection of the two concepts of responsible and accountable citizen leaders to the streets of Ghana. It reveals what we have become. So walk with me and let me take you through the streets to tell us what indeed our society has become. And I'll start with what our roads depict as an absolute disregard for traffic regulations. We jump red lights with impunity, we drive on pavements and road aprons, we refuse to stop at pedestrian crossing, and we chase presidential and ministerial convoys and exhibit a total disregard for the well-being of others. We put pedestrians in danger and abuse the rights of road users who by traffic regulations have right of way. Indiscipline on our roads in terms of welfare leads to accidents, 
loss of life and property. Economically, much productivity is lost every day to traffic jams. Instead of our policemen being available to perform their primary function of protecting the citizenry, they must rather focus their efforts on being traffic wardens because we refuse to be disciplined on the roads. Let's translate this in discipline on our roads. And we find that indiscipline pervades our homes, our schools, our churches, our workplaces, our business communities, and all public spaces, detrimental, with a detrimental effect on productivity and national development. And this is staggeringly clear. Of course, we are all aware that our roads have been identified as the number one place where Ghanaians witness corruption. CNCC's research on public opinion on corruption, accountability, and environmental governance in 2017. A third of the reported corruption incidents, according to our respondents, took place on our roads between the road user and a public officer. And this corruption benefits only the individual taking it and adds up to robbing Ghana of about $3 billion annually. Money that could wean us off donor dependency. The dream and essence of our Ghana beyond aid. When we as citizen leaders fail to speak up against the conduct of the policeman and the church road driver, we have condoned corruption. And I say that if we, as citizens, lead by condemning or reporting any act of corruption, it emboldens a new anti-corruption movement. But sadly, we have collectively failed to minimize corruption. Corruption, as we know, festers poverty. It breaks down social justice and cripples the essence essence of democratic governance. And then again, our streets, our roads, our drains. They reflect the poor sanitary conditions we live in. It also reflects the absence of responsible and accountable citizen leaders. The rains expose the careless disposal of plastics and other waste, potholes, filled with coconut husks by coconut sellers who do not want to pay for the disposal of waste from their profits. Yet we as citizens are responsible for safeguarding the environment and it is contained in the duties of a citizen in our constitution. What happened to our national sanitation exercise on the first Saturday of every month? How many of us, by our daily lives, fully aware of the menace of plastics, have conscientiously reduced, reused, or recycled plastics? How have we lived our duty, pay Article 41K? Ghanaians see the use of motorcades by institutional heads and public servants as a display of an ill-conceived entitlement to our roads over and above everyone else, whilst putting the ordinary road users in needless danger. Responsible citizen leaders as heads of institutions should set off early, or at least help solve the traffic menace, so we all can get to our destinations on time. On the same streets, we witness the running engines and ACs of big men as they attend their functions, lest they melt like butter if they should return to warm vehicles. All these demonstrate a failure to protect and preserve public property and ensure the prudent use of public resources 
as we are enjoined to do by Article 41F. This phenomenon depicts the total sense of entitlement and abuse of office, which has come to characterize high public service. And now I will turn to the issue of gender inequality. And perhaps you will wonder, what has that got to do with our streets? But as we walk through, you will understand and appreciate. Half of citizen leaders are women who are as capable as the other half. Yet women suffer hostility even on the roads of Ghana. Women drivers are perceived to be inferior and driving expensive cars connotes shady morals. It begs the question why we impute incompetence and gains through ill means to women drivers. But we must recognize that our constitution guarantees women equal rights in Article 27 to realize their full potential. Therefore, hostility, exploitation, abuse of anything that frustrates this right represents a failure to demonstrate responsible and accountable citizen leadership. Our failure to pass into law the affirmative action bill and the abysmal number of women representatives in parliament and leadership generally are clear indicators of our failure to close the gap on gender inequality. How do we expect to be productive when over 50% of our citizenry, the women, cannot realize their full potential? and only because of the hostility they suffer. Today, when you speak up as a woman, you are called all manner of names. And it frustrates women in being part of the governance processes of this country. And it intimidates women and keeps them from realizing that full potential. I have been tagged as somebody who is on a wanted list to be slapped because I dared to speak against vigilantism. But ask yourself, if a man had made those comments, had spoken up against vigilantism, do you think anyone would get up and say, I will slap that man? But I'm a woman, and therefore, I can't be slapped. And our roads, the hostility on our roads, is a reflection of the larger hostility in our country. How can we realize the full potential of women when our girls are often abused and raped in educational institutions by teachers? Ironically, the provision on realizing the full potential of women refers to equal rights to training and promotion. And training more often than not occurs in educational facilities. It is pertinent to note that teenage pregnancy is on the rise in most regions where it is prevalent, resulting in high dropout rates for young girls. How then can women effectively contribute to national development? And our roads again tell us a story that we are failing our youth. It is commonplace to see children begging on the streets, offering windscreen cleaning services, and our young girls engaged in prostitution at night. Research by Dr. Georgino Drew of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology of the University of Ghana reveals a high prevalence of child prostitution in Ghana by girls as young as 11 years. According to the report, the driving factors of this trend include poverty, poor parenting, and peer pressure. But I must say, poverty may not be a choice, but poor parenting certainly is. Therefore, responsible citizen leaders in the home acting as parents can make real 
the provisions of Article 28.1e of the Constitution and ensure that we promote the best interest of children by instilling in them values that make them, that equip them for real citizenship, for real engagement as citizen leaders. These developments amplify the importance of Article 39.1, which enjoins the state, you and I as citizen leaders, to encourage the integration of appropriate customary values into the fabric of national life through formal and informal education and the conscious introduction of cultural dimensions to relevant aspects of national planning. We have failed our young ones and we have failed ourselves. Most of us today are guilty of looking the other way when we see a child, someone's child, in, involved in any act that is detrimental to the child's interest. And by so doing, what have we done? We have set our future to failure mode. Attend to the poor state of our roads and structures. Today, in the last week or so, the people of Adenta have clamored for footbridges because it is killing us. It is such a topical issue and I must commend CTFM for following through with this and ensuring that we keep the conversation going. We have poorly constructed roads because we have failed to work conscientiously in our lawfully chosen occupation. Again, see Article 41E. We are aware of contractors who connive with government officials to pass off shoddy jobs as acceptable standards of work whilst being paid huge sums of money. In this regard, we witness the collusion of public and private actors to the detriment of citizen leaders. As citizen leaders, we fail to demand accountability for these wanton acts of corruption at our district assemblies. We have laws that empower us as citizen leaders to participate in decision-making processes at the centralized government level. Article 35.6D provides for the true realization of democracy by affording all possible opportunities to people to participate in decision making at every level in national life and in government. Yet we fail to participate at district level elections and in, in demanding information regarding infrastructural development in our communities, in demanding accountability at district level and complain of poor infrastructure, which also leads to our seeming pension for mediocrity, though excellence is not beyond us. And yet if one should inspect any road, any drain, or stretch of street lights, the lack of excellence in our work ethic is glaring. Mediocrity in the production of goods and services whether by large companies or artisans, leaves us at the mercy of foreign competition. And we claim that we have no jobs. The challenges that test our responsibility and accountability as citizen leaders are many that must be overcome. And my preceding words give us a snapshot of our challenges and how we have failed ourselves as a people. Addressing the ideals of responsible and accountable citizen leaders, to my mind, is to focus on our mission as a country, which is expressed in our constitution. Our vision is expressed in the guiding principles of the S sorry, Sustainable Development Goals, particularly Goal 16, 
as well as our 40 year national development plan. So with humility, let me suggest a few key strategies that we must adopt, but by all means, these are not exhaustive. Firstly, we must break the luck, the, the back of corruption. Corruption has been confirmed to undermine economic development and jeopardize the allocation of resources to sectors crucial for national development. The resulting adverse effect is underdevelopment seen in illiteracy, in poverty, poor health, low income, food insecurity, and in sanitary conditions. Secondly, we must sanitize and stabilize the political space. When there is a total acceptance of the political regime by citizens who find the processes of governance as legitimate, as legitimate political stability can be achieved. With this in place, we would have no portions of the citizenry undertaking any activities to undermine a regime or government. And this leads to development when equality of opportunity and social justice encourages all to endeavor to contribute to national development. We should have a vibrant political space, free of violence and political thuggery, now referred to as vigilantism. Within the political space, the fact remains that our political stability as a country and development is largely dependent on the citizen leaders' appreciation of their rights and responsibilities. Indeed, civic education provides the society with information on actions and behaviors expected of a good citizen. Civic education gives people the knowledge and skills to understand, challenge, and engage with the pillars of our democracy. Thirdly, we should end political interference in the work of public institutions. Proper political involvement includes engagements that provide regulators and institutions with important information regarding the impacts of regulatory decisions. It holds regulators accountable for their decisions under the law, provides politicians with information that they may use for making policy decisions and informing constituents and follow accepted, accepted, accepted procedures with sufficient transparency to ensure that the public is confident that regulation is legitimately implementing established laws and policies without stakeholder bias. Improper political interference violates procedures seeks to bias regulatory decision making or seeks regulatory decisions that violate the letter or spirit of laws and policies that regulation is designed to implement. Four, we must use the media, including social media, to promote firstly productive debate and secondly the watchdog of governance. The media, of course, is encumbered with the responsibility of dissemination of information. Information that reinforces the values of the nation with the purpose of rigorous interrogation of actions and inactions of leadership at all level, levels for citizen leader accountability. Social media in our times plays a very significant role in molding social consciousness and engendering active citizenship. It has provided an unfettered access 
for online personalities to share technical expertise to help improve the abilities of citizens to interrogate issues from an informed and engaged position. And social media, as we find today, I call keyboard thuggery, where people go vent, rant and rave, and don't do anything about. But we want a social media that molds our consciousness into moving our country forward and not festering hate amongst us. The fifth strategy is economic transformation. Economic transformation should end hardships as a major barrier to the development of civic responsibility as it suppresses the avenues of socialization. The two basic avenues of socialization, the family unit, nuclear and extended, and formal education, seem to have lost its grip on the civic socialization of children as citizen leaders. And as a consequence of the economic hardships and the general transformation of the economy from a simple agrarian one to a more complex industrial and urbanized one. Parents are compelled to spend long hours pursuing economic and status goals, thereby reducing the amount of time spent on the socialization of the child at home. We should strive for economic transformation that ensures a work-family life balance. And I see a direct relationship between economic transformation and its impact on the values that we instill in children from the home. My sixth is that education must reflect our national value system. Education at home and in schools must instill universal values including integrity, excellence, hard work, tolerance, and punctuality. Some of the values we as Ghanaians aspire to include the values of freedom and rights, fearless honesty, and humility as contained in our national anthem. And I say this again, that until we teach our values purposefully, deliberately, intentionally to our young ones, listen, we will continue to scratch the surface of the many ills of our society. Today we talk about anti-corruption and we have all these ideas on how to deal with anti-corruption. But I say that until we teach the child from the home, which is reinforced in school, that honesty pays, hard work pays, our children will continue and not see anything wrong with corruption. So perhaps we should go back to the basics and begin to speak to the issue of values as a key national conversation that will transform our mindset in this country. We should work with religious leaders and our traditional rulers as co-builders of responsible and accountable citizen leaders. It is essential that our religious and traditional platforms are used for moral instruction that serve to buttress the two basic avenues of socialization, the family and the education system. I believe it's when we have understood that the role of religious bodies is not to give us um, those, um, what's it called, those magic potions and stickers as the panacea to all our woes. When we understand, when true religious leaders understand that they have a role to play in national building, it is only then that we can collectively achieve a, a society that we are proud of and which promotes the good name of Ghana. 
Permit me to touch briefly then on NCC's mandate and how our work contributes to raising civic-minded Ghanaians. Our work engenders and enlightens civic responsibility and actions which should lead the country to accountability in governance processes and approaches. For the economy of time, please read articles 231 to 239 of the Constitution and the National Commission for Civic Education Act 1993, Act 452, which can also be found on our website, nccgh.org. NCC provides education to all segments of the Ghanaian citizenry. Some of the programs are targeted at students, youth groups, identifiable groups, which include market women, professional associations, churches and mosques, organized labor, and traditional rulers. These programs are carried out through the media, both traditional and social media, community engagement, docudramas, research, games, social auditing programs, amongst others. The lack of resources to the NCC to carry out civic engagements and public education and the provisions of the Constitution has also been a barrier to the inculcation of real and engaged civic responsibility. Therefore, the clamor of Ghanaians for the NCC to do more tells me that we understand the importance of the role of this key institution. But the clamor for NCC to do more and the criticisms that we receive, constructive criticisms we welcome because it serves to improve us as an institution. But criticisms that just speak negatively of, a, of an institution, when we fail to understand that it is the lack of resources that has clearly hampered the effective role of NCC. These criticisms should rather find expression in the clamor by the citizenry for NCC to be properly resourced to execute our mandate effectively. The way forward for cohesive national development. But before I get to that point, I'd like to talk also about the role of media and how media um, works symbiotically with NCC in ensuring that Ghanaians become civic-minded, Ghanaians become engaged. Until the media understands that it has a role to play with NCC, we will continue to speak at a disconnect. And as we do so, we would be doing the people of Ghana a great injustice. So I urge the media to take a keen interest in the role of NCC and in ensuring that we work together in fulfilling what is expected of us under the Constitution. As a country, the time has come for us to work consciously towards ensuring that our constitutional provisions on responsible citizenship, sorry, which largely influences our behaviors when we find ourselves in leadership position is adhered to properly. As a nation, we will stay undeveloped and unchanged unless and until we as active citizen leaders finding expression in strong leadership, in leadership with integrity and with ethics, purposefully seek to transform. National change is active. It involves policy deliberation and planning for long-term good. So whilst we continue to assume it is the responsibility of government or public servants, we must remember that it is the citizen by his or her active involvement who superintends this. I challenge all of us to get involved in local community governance at district level by at least identifying who our unit committee members are and engaging them 
to ascertain how assemblies are fashioning out our development agenda. It is equally paramount in reiterating that family, education, and religious spheres play a major role in this shift. It is the family values, educational values, and the moral construct from religious platforms that mold individuals into political actors as citizen leaders in the social, business, or government machinery. We cannot demand constructive change of the politician, the media, business community, the arts, culture, sports, when we have not paid attention to our family, to our education, and to the religious system. And a key step to achieving accountable and responsible citizen leaders is to accept and appreciate the pivotal role that comprehensive knowledge in civics plays in shaping the thoughts and attitudes of all of us as citizen leaders. I believe that if people are adequately informed about their roles and responsibilities as citizens and positively exhibit the tenets of responsible and accountable citizen leadership in our various endeavors, then we can proudly have a society where parents guide their children by instilling in them positive values that embolden them to stand for truth and justice cardinal to our national values with a high sense of integrity. Of course, I must mention the crucial role of motherhood in nation building as nurturing and guiding the youth as useful citizen leaders. It emphasizes the power women hold in charting the path of nation building, especially in these times of a near social deconstruction. It means we would have a society where teachers teach with a calling and a passion, not to be negative role models, not to be predators. Teachers that teach our youth to create wealth and not to breed a mindset of riches and materialism. Our education system must help children to identify skill set and fit them in the proper place that develops these skills that help to build our nation. Religious bodies must understand their role of using their platforms to engender right thinking based on strong pillars, strong moral pillars, hard work, devoid of any magic formula, potion, anointing oil, holy water, and stickers to the land of utopia. We want a society where citizen leaders are awake and alive to being vigilant in holding all public servants and officials accountable and understand that we are the unelected governance officers who must fulfill our civic leadership responsibilities. We want political leadership that speaks to the hearts and minds of all Ghanaians and not to the pockets of party financiers and foot soldiers. We must first build and then elect or appoint leaders with a mindset that cultivates, a mindset that nurtures, that contemplates and innovates with the ability to process and convert ideas into products and services that benefit all of us citizen leaders. So the question is, are we doomed as a society, as a country? And my emphatic answer is no. Is there hope? Yes, because I believe in Ghana, and I believe in each and every one of us seated here. 
I believe in each and every one that hears what we speak about today. And I see that hope in platforms like this, where you'd speak about the Ghana Action Series to change and radicalize mindset, mindset that transforms. I see it in the entrepreneurial spirits of young leaders, citizen leaders, like Fred Degby. I see it in the resilience of citizen leaders like Farida Bedwi. And I see it in the vigilant citizen leaders like Anas Aremeyao, who risk their lives every day to expose corruption. On this note, may I say that if we're going to move our country forward, it is not just by speaking, it's by action. And the actions I have clearly depicted in our daily lives, just on the streets of Ghana, if each and every one of us will be conscious of our actions, I believe very strongly and with every fiber of my, of our, my being that we would have moved our country in the right direction. We would have set the pace for development in our country that does not rely on government as one group of people and citizens as another group of people. If we understand that in each and every one of us lies a citizen leader, then we would realize that every single act I take, I must lead by example. You don't need to be elected. You don't need to be appointed to be a leader. I challenge us all to rise as leaders and move our country forward in the right mindset. Thank you very much for your attention. Please, another round of applause. Yes, I, I told you. Are you charged enough? Yes, thank you. Josephine Nkrumah, uh, the boss at the National Commission for Civic Education. Very um, firm action there, and I believe that's a call to action, and we will all uh, listen and take the call and move forward. Thank you very much. This is 97.3 CTFM that you are listening to, and also you're watching us on Facebook Live. It's the Ghana Action Series, the second edition. The first one we brought to you was on sanitation. This time around, we've moved it a notch higher, and we are talking about responsible citizenship and accountable governance. Who is getting it right, and who mm -hmm. is getting it wrong, and how have we fared? Uh, Josephine Nkrumah there in her delivery said, we are not doomed and she believes in Ghana. I'm sure if she had said this in 2008, it would mean something else. <laughs> but she believes in Ghana, and she says there's hope. So there is hope. Let me now, at this juncture, quickly acknowledge our traditional leaders who are with us, which means that we have the visa to be in Accra and hold this uh, big ceremony. So we have Ni Ayi Bonti II. Ni Ayi Bonti II is based in Manche. Please, a round of applause. We also have Bonnie King Taki Adama Lache, the second. Gamanche. Thank you so much. We have Ni Taki Komi, uh, that's the Gastu Fathers. Thank you. <laughs> Nene Achri Benta the third is the greater with the Greater Accra Regional House of Chiefs. Salutation, please. Thank you. <laughs> Manye Amponsan Dokuya is from Osudoku traditional area. Then we have Nana Kabukuo Dumali, who is with the Adan traditional area. <laughs> Moye, yes, yes. And then we have Na Osabu Abe, who is queen mother of the Pram Pram traditional area. Thank you. Finally, we have Nene Kweyate Lakpleku II, Great Ningo traditional council. No more Moye, thank you very much. So. You'll be wondering maybe, what is one Ghana movement? So we've been talking about, of course, 97.3 CTFM, you know, we are celebrating 14 years. City TV is giving you the live coverage. We are happy, everybody knows us. Uh, NCCE is in a constitution. If you know the 1992 constitution, then you know the NCCE, except that many hold a view that it was dormant for some time. Uh, maybe it's reviving now. Hopefully there's more power. You didn't talk about your building, but yes, we'll talk about that at a later time. 
and resources. You mentioned resources there. So who is One Ghana Movement, or what is One Ghana Movement? What have we been up to, and what are we planning to do? Let me invite quickly the Executive Secretary of One Ghana Movement, Emily New, uh, to help us uh, with a quick rundown of what we've done so far and what we are planning to do. Emily, please, uh, your audience. Thank you, Maru. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would respectfully like to borrow Madam Chairperson's protocol as well as I greet you again and then brief you on what One Ghana Movement is, what we've done so far, and where we intend to go. So One Ghana Movement basically is a thought leadership and social action not-for-profit organization with three basic objectives, which are one, to promote citizen responsibility, to promote prioritization of national interest over partisan politics, as well as promoting public policy accountability. Now, One Ghana Movement was launched right here at the British Council last year, um, June 2017, on the anniversary of the June 3rd disaster. That was our very first project we worked on, still working on. Why that? Well, we believe that beyond talking about um, the disaster, we need to, as a people, ensure that it does not happen. How do we do this? By holding individuals and organizations accountable. And we are working actively on this. After this, um, J4J3, which is a Justice for June 3rd project, we came to the first Ghana Action Series. As Umaru mentioned, it was on sanitation. Sanitation is the major problem. And so we are working with stakeholders, and all of you are very welcome to work with us to combat this problem of sanitation. Following this sanitation talk, we had the Right Way Initiative, which is basically doing everything in the right way. So are you throwing rubbish away in the right way? Are you driving the right way? Uh, are people being accountable? Are people being responsible? This is what the Right Way Initiative is about. The Right Way Initiative birthed what we called the Adopt a Bin campaign, which was to literally put out public litter bins on all our streets. So we started with the Liberation Road, where we have a number of public litter bins. We're working with the AMA and Ministry of Sanitation on this project, and would like to encourage all of you to adopt a bin. I have your details, so I'll send you the email and the details of how to come on board that project. We'll be very glad to have all of you on board. After the adopt a bin, we have this second Ghana Action Series, which is about accountability. It is a very, very dear topic to us. As you can see, that's one of our objectives. And so that's what we are working on. We intend to have a lot of citizens being responsible for our actions and also holding um, our leaders accountable as well. Now, we've also worked with um, schools. So we have community grassroots engagements where we go to schools and engage the students, they have to learn. The values have to be built from the ground. So that's what we are doing with that. We also have our University of Ghana chapter here. We have some of our students here. That's another thing we are doing, working with our younger ones to ensure that they have the capacity to work on our projects, to work on what our objectives stand for. Moving forward, what do we intend to do? Basically, we just want to work on projects and to educate everyone. Vigorous education is what we intend to go on to ensure that there's a change of mindset and to build values which will help us all achieve the very necessary change we seek. So now I'll just invite all Ghanaians and all of us present here to come on board One Ghana Movement as we all work as volunteers, basically, and to help us work for our common good. One Ghana movement, another pledge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily New there. She's the executive secretary at One Ghana Movement. Our administrator 
in, in chief. Uh, she does this with Baba Encho, who is in the background there. And uh, they are very hardworking in ensuring that one Ghana movement uh, rises above all. So quickly ahead, what we'll be doing is that I'll be putting the microphone across so you can also tell us what we should be doing as citizens, what we are not doing right, and what the governance people are also not doing right, and what we can do right. That's what we're going to do quickly ahead. But let's, uh, in 15 minutes, do a quick panel discussion. And so let me invite uh, back on stage our uh, NCC chairperson, uh, Madam Josephine Nkrumah, uh, she's part of a panel quickly. And then we also have Professor H. Kwesi Prempe, who is with the Center for Democratic Development, Ghana. Prof, please join us upstage. And Mr. Kofi Abochi is a former dean of the Gimpa Law School and managing partner at Axis Lega. These are my three panelists. And I, Umar Rusanda Amadou, would be your moderator. It's going to be in 15 minutes. We'll have a quick uh, conversation, a deliberation. And then we'll bring the microphone to your uh, side. And then we can quickly end this discussion. So uh, can we take our seats? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I already have said the questions. And I'm just going to limit myself to two questions. And uh, I would have your take generally. And you can please pick the microphones by you. Now the question is, the theme is accountable, uh, responsible citizenship, and accountable governance. What are we getting wrong? Getting right, and how can we fix the wrongs that we have identified? I think I should start with Prof. Prof, you are the democracy person. Thank you. I think your microphone is off. Okay. Good morning. Um, well, I think uh, the speaker, Madam Nkrumah, essentially answered the question. I think when she said uh, failed leadership is failed citizenship, I think that goes to the crux of the issue. That when we see what appears to us to be failed leadership, the, the source is essentially us. All right. Um, not only does power emanate from the people, that's what our constitution tells us, uh, but uh, lawyer Abochi and uh, uh, the other lawyers will tell us that if, if power emanates from the people, and uh, then those who exercise power do so on a delegated basis from us. Right? So we delegate power to the leaders and we know from the lawyers that delegation is not abdication, right? That when you delegate, you don't then abdicate. You follow through, you monitor, you uh, hold the leaders accountable. And so if that is not happening, and we're seeing leadership failure at all levels, then I think that we are citizens, and I like the concept of citizen leaders, which actually really uh, again, emphasizes the idea that these are not uh, separate entities. Uh, these are two sides of the same coin. These are Siamese twins, more or less, right? There's a citizen and the leader. The leader emanates from us, comes from within our bowels. So I think that's really the, the, the idea here, that mm. we should not see leaders and government as separate from us mm. and as distinct from us, but as, as part of us, and that what uh, they fail to do is a reflection on what it is that we are failing to do as citizens. Okay. But what about the view that, all right, we are all citizens, and some of us decided that we are incompetent at leading, so we chose a few of them sure. uh, and gave them the job, and we pay them and make their lives comfortable. Their job is simply to get things done for us. We clearly should be absolved from the irresponsibility of the, of the, of the leaders, shouldn't we? Well, we don't just elect them one time. Um, we elect them periodically. That means that in the period between um, the elections, we have a role to play because they'll come back to us to renew that mandate. And on what basis are we going to renew that mandate if we don't monitor the work they are doing mm. in the interim? Mm. So election, election is only just one of the roles that we have as okay. citizens. In fact, okay. The very first role that citizens had uh, uh, was not even to elect. You know, democracy is actually a much later invention. Mm. Citizens were paying taxes 
before they had the power to elect. So when you elect people, you don't just let them go. It's almost like an employer and an employee, and that's exactly what leaders okay. are to us. Okay. We are the employers, they are the employee. You would not employ somebody and say, well, I'm not competent, so I elected, I have employed you to do the work, mm -hmm. so you're on your own. Okay. Okay. You as the employer, as the person paying the salary, providing them with the resources, it's incumbent on you to check them. To check them. All right. Let me bring in Madam. Madam, is it that our civic duties, we probably do not know our civic duties as, as, as individuals. Is it your job to teach us the, the duties, responsibilities as citizens? Yes. Um, I think largely there is, to my mind, a certain disconnect between um, the people and what we see as our duties in the Constitution. And I think it's because um, the Constitution has been made to look like some abstract document sitting somewhere that only gets tested in court or you speak big English because you're a lawyer and you talk about constitutional rights and things. But when people begin to understand that the Constitution affects our lives on a daily basis. And so if you run through the many, um, what do you call it, um, duties of a citizen, you would find the number one thing and which I like is to promote the prestige and good name of Ghana and respect the symbols of the nation. So what is it that you do that promotes the good name of Ghana? When you're littering the street, does that connote promoting the good name of Ghana? When you act in a manner that is detrimental to others and the well-being of the larger community, does that promote the good name of Ghana? I think when we begin to understand that my duty as a citizen fundamentally is to ensure that whatever I do, I use my, my best skill to ensure that it benefits me and everybody else. Okay. So there should be that larger consciousness as a, as a citizen of Ghana that what I do impacts one person and the other. So whether I am a citizen, ordinary citizen, or whether I am a citizen as a leader, mm -hmm. ultimately I should ask this question. Okay. How does that impact on the well-being and welfare of my community? Let me bring in the lawyer. Uh, Ms. Abochi, I, I think you can pick this microphone. So, is it that we have not tested the laws enough? Are the laws even enough for us? Uh, could that be the area that we are lacking in? We are not lacking in laws. We have a lot of laws in our country. In fact, in some areas, we are actually suffering from glut of the laws. Mm -hmm. There's a danger sometimes of having too many laws because it creates the impression that the abundance of laws is equivalent to solutions, but they're not. Laws are of themselves not self-enforcing. Somebody has to enforce them. Now, there's a cost to enforcement. The cost is not only in financial terms. The cost is also in terms of time, manpower, and in the trust of the institutions. I think sometimes our politicians know this, that there's, only, there's a limit to which you can go to court. And even where you go to court, and we've seen that in Ghana in recent times, there can be a contestation as to what the meaning of the judgment is. Mm -hmm. So people come out and say, well, the court has given a ruling, but even that, the court did not tell us to do this. You probably have to go back again to court for a further interpretation of the order. There's a cost to litigation, and this cost to litigation can sometimes create a, cycli a cyclical situation which can create disillusionment. I think that we have all the laws, but the willingness of the leaders the willingness of the people to stay within the boundaries of the decisions given by the institutions or the courts and the injunctions of the laws. That is what you actually need for the effectiveness of the laws. Unfortunately, we have all the laws, but in reality, our commitment to actually sticking by these laws is what has often kept us wanting. How do we get a legal whip to ensuring accountability on the elected? A legal whip. I'm not sure what exactly that means, but I'm sure you're asking, how do we ensure that people, there's someone checking them? Yes. A police, an effective mm -hmm. policeman. I'm just going to take it from a broader standpoint. And I think from the perspective of the brilliant lecture given by our speaker, when JFK uttered words that people should not ask of the government or the state what the state can do for them, but they should rather ask what they can do for the state, there was an assumption that when people give to the collectivity, 
by the collectivity, there will be a general benefit which will come ultimately to the citizen. Because the reality is that the state is an abstraction. There's, there's no state. I mean, we have just formed a legal entity called the state, but the state really is us. And so if we all contribute to the state, ultimately we are contributing to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now back to the question, how do we get institutions to become functional? We get institutions to become functional when we have leaders who are willing to respect the limitations of the institutions. I think one of the regrettable things we've had in Ghana, and it's, I say this cautiously, is the situation of parliament. All these conversations we're having, and I think we are for the first time trying to come from the level of the strictly political to the level of the citizen. But in reality, the essence of government, the history of government, stems from the failure of the collectivity. The collectivity, we can't all meet. We can't meet a circle or somewhere and just take a decision. Mm -hmm. The collectivity are an abstraction which is impotent. So all of us, in reality, we are impotent. Even when we go to vote, you know, we vote, somebody has to still decide whether the vote we've put in there is properly counted. So ultimately, it is the elected who have to make the difference. The concept of the framers of our constitution was to put together a group of people who are parliament, structured in a certain way, who are going to lead us by ensuring that the executive authority, and let's face it, executives everywhere enjoy power. That's how executives are. Mm -hmm. So what you do is to supplant on the executive a group of people who are not strictly political, who have different incentive expectations, and who will ensure that the executive are kept in check. Parliament was supposed to play that role. Unfortunately, starting from the first parliament, which is the historical problem we had, starting from the first parliament which, came, which started in 93, there was an expectation that this is our president, this is our executive. Parliament's expectation was therefore to go in there and to promote the agenda of their executive. So you have parties in Parliament seeing themselves as extension of the executive. I think that is where we got it wrong until today. If Parliament was to play its accountability role and responsibility as expected of Parliament, the identity footbridge would not be a problem. And the reason it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a problem is that the Minister of Rules and Highways by now would have been in Parliament answering questions, and those question time in Parliament will not be perfunctory they will be substantive because somebody may pay a dear price for the failure to perform a ministerial function. So the structure of government right from the base to the top macro are, are, are designed in such a way to ensure that there are reciprocal checks. Mm. Unfortunately, mm. those checks have not been working and we've, had, we've just had a situation where we've had strong and effective executives but the rest have become extension of that executive and that is not supposed to have been the design. Let me bring in Prof. Prof, in the absence of the state machinery working to perfection, your microphone is there. What can the citizens, citizenry do? So we see demonstrations and all these things. What options are left? The citizenry uh, is still the option that's left. It's, it's the beginning and the end, essentially. Uh, I think the solitary citizen, the citizen acting alone is important, right? So sometimes there's a problem and just one citizen just wakes up and decides I'll go to court about this matter. So there is a role for the solitary citizen, but I think that the more effective uh, role is for collective action. You know, we need to build bridges, coalitions, movements, uh, because when the citizenry acts with a mobilized voice, uh, when the citizenry acts in an organized fashion, then it has more political weight. And leaders respond to collective action a lot more. Mm -hmm. you know, so, because within government itself, there are collectives. You know, we talk about foot soldiers. These are all very organized groups. And if there are no counter mobilizations within society, if citizens themselves are not organized, and it's those in power who are organized, then their voices and their preferences will prevail. Mm -hmm because they are also organized to achieve political goals. So the powers that be would likely respond more to their, their voices. So it's incumbent on us as citizens to actually also organize, mobilize, um, um, band together to do things, mm -hmm. which is why things like the Ghana movement, groups like the Ghana, uh, One Ghana movement, mm -hmm. civil society organizations, these are all very important. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, I'm not saying that even, even without that, the solitary citizen is still important. I mean, the citizen who just decides that, look, I am not going to sit down and wait for collective action. Because mm -hmm. having collective action is a cost. 
like my friend Abochi just said, to actually get citizens to band together takes a lot of time, mm -hmm. takes resources, takes effort. Sometimes you're not going to get collective action. But the solitary citizen who is the one who is most agitated by, by the idea, by the, the problem, it's also still very important. Okay. We need solitary citizens. Sometimes mm -hmm. there are many, many societies that have been moved towards change by just the action of one person. So both the solitary citizen who is agitated by uh, what's going on and wants change is important, but so is collective action if we can get it. And I think that those two together uh, is what we need to counter the kind of decay and the kind of despair sometimes that we see. Okay, let me bring Madame, Madame again. Solitary citizen, local citizen, that's how I even want to introduce it now. Most of these things are local agitations. Do you get the sense when you go around the country trying to educate people that government is so distant? There are people who hold a view that decentralization actually would be the solution to a lot of the problems we are having. I think decentralization plays a critical role in transformation. And again, I'll bring it back to um, that um, ignorance that we have as a people. I think we, we fail to see the power we wield as a solitary citizen or the collective voice. And um, when we begin to realize, when we have that consciousness that my voice can go to make a change. I'll give you an example. There was a young gentleman. We had a workshop um, towards the district level elections in 2015. And we, we educated a youth group on how they could go to district assemblies and ask for documents or information regarding projects and what was the basis for a right, uh, coming to this decision that this was the best project for us. And this young gentleman actually put it into action. So a few months later, he calls me up and he says, oh, madam, I'm one of the young gentlemen NCC um, engaged on this day. And I said, oh, okay, you know, how, how, how can I help you? And he said, you know, following that, there was an issue in his community involving the siting of a certain building that, <clears throat> to their mind, was going to obstruct the flow of water. And bearing in mind what had happened on June 3, he had taken the matter up with a few young boys and they had gone to the district assembly and demanded persistently every day that we don't want this building here. In fact, maybe they became a nuisance, but long and short of it was they had that building, um, um, what's it called? Um, removed? Removed, Or yes. relocated? Yes. Okay. And that made a change. Okay. You see, so when people are aware of this fact that I can do something. And in fact, there are laws that back it. Mm -hmm. So you are not acting in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. You are acting within a certain legal framework mm -hmm. that empowers you to carry out the action that you take and mm -hmm. the demands that you seek. And when people realize that this is not somebody who is ignorant, this, this person understands what he's talking about, I think after a while, the message goes down and the message you know, they, they, they get to, to, to um, achieve uh, what they want. Take action on it. Okay. Yes. So you're still listening to the uh, Ghana Action Series uh, organized by One Ghana Movement and uh, with support from CTFM and NCC. And we are live on 97.3 CTFM and also on Facebook. So quickly, let's see if we can get some comments from the audience. If you have questions, you've listened to the panel discussion, you listened to our keynote speaker. Uh, Oshes, can we take the microphones around? Quick questions so that we can uh, be wrapping up soon because we are live on air and we need to. Yes, can we have the microphone in front, please? Um, who is helping with the microphone? Nicholas, please. Yes. Please take the microphone down here. Here, this way. Yes. All right. Please, your name and uh, your, your comment quickly. Thank you very much. My name is Jonathan Takikome. I was a former member of parliament. My is a comment. I'm very happy about the program, and I wish to comment uh, one Ghana. We all have to join hands with them if really we want to see Ghana develop. Yes, a lot have been said. Responsible citizenship and accountable governance. It's true. 
when the my senior auntie Joyce spoke, he compared the bridges that are being built and the rest. And it's true. Many a times consultations are needed. Citizens have put people in governance. But when something is going to be done within the areas, there's no consultation. Probably they may need a school, but we at the top decide to give them a hospital, which is not what is needed there. So I think one of the most important things is consultation. Also involvement of each of us, just like uh, the governance expert said. Many times we put the people there and we think everything should be left to them. No. They are governing us. We have given them the mandate. So please, let us all come together and assist in the governance of the country. Well, as a former member of parliament, I can't sit without commenting on what our legal man told us. And it is a fact. I was a former member of parliament, but I agree with him. Because in the first place, we have separation of powers. And what do I mean by separation of powers? We have the executive, we have the legislature, which is parliament, and then we have the judiciary. Meanwhile, within the executive, part of his governance comes from parliament. Because the constitution says to test of the appointment of ministers by the president should come from parliament. So right from the onset, we've weakened parliament. And parliament, by law, is supposed to have an oversight responsibility over the executive. So if most of the ministers are appointed from parliament, do we think this will go okay. on as we expected? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Jonathan Nita, he a former Ododo member of parliament there. Uh, do we have more comments? Um, all right, please. There's a microphone. Uh, yes, can you? <clears throat> My name is Nene Amano Akebeto I, representing the paramount chief of Osudoku traditional area. Please, so is it the Osudoku or Shai Osudoku or? Osudoku. Uh, in Osu here. Shai is a different tradition. Ah, okay. I wanted, to be, I wanted to associate with you. Forgive me. Thank you very uh, much. You are most go, welcome. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I want to associate myself with a very serious issue that Madam Chairperson of the NCC raised. I think there is a reason for the creation of the National Commission for Civic Education. To me, if we can achieve whatever we are discussing here today and Ghana should become what we want Ghana to become, will largely depend on NCC. Uh, one of my lecturers once told me, the beginning of development of society begins from the development of the human being. And the beginning of the development of the human being begins from the development of his or her consciousness. Mm. So if you agree with me, then I think that there is the urgent need to resource the NCC. Okay. That is my main concern. Secondly, the offices of the NCC must even go further. Like we have the unit committee, the unit committees. That is for the NCC. The second issue I want to raise is about the traditional leaders. In the olden days, our colonial masters had a reason for using our traditional leaders for the indirect rule. It was not only for their economic interest, but both political and social. And you could see that the colonial masters were able to achieve a lot out of that. Okay. But today's constitution, or today's laws in Ghana, has withdrawn a lot of powers or authority from our chiefs. But our chiefs too are another powerful segment of the social educators in Ghana. Mm. Okay. But because right. of lack of resources and the powers or authorities that have withdrawn them, in fact, we have become I mean, virtually toothless dogs. It has limited our 
rose that expected mm. of us to contribute to what we are doing today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Uh, two more qu questions or comments quickly. Yes, please. There's a, there's a hand up here. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Ohineba Kofintiyama from the Christian Council of Ghana. Uh, I just want to find out from uh, Madam Chairperson and the speaker that uh, one of the strategies that she mentioned was that uh, we have to educate, uh, or education must be inst instilled over our, sorry, education must instill our values in our young ones. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, very interested in that portion just because uh, uh, I know of ethics. And quite recently, I did my MBA, and it was at that level that they started teaching MBA students ethics, and it's a core <laughs> subject. May I kindly find out if NCC can have a collaboration with GES so that this ethics as a program is introduced at the basic levels. Okay. Because at this point in time, me, <laughs> it's already. <laughs> you, you have already you. been unethical for decades. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. Please pass the microphone on to the next person. <laughs> okay. Teaching ethics. Thank you very own. much. Yes. Mm. My name is also Fukwam, Convention People's Party. I have a simple question. Do we have rule of law in Ghana? and our so-called democratic dispensation? Or do we have rule of personalities, parties, and ministers? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a few hands at this side. Yes, let's take those, and then we can conclude. All right, thank you very much. My name is Prosper Swampi De Mata, a student of University of Ghana. Um, please. Um, where there is information, there is enlightenment. And here is the case, most people do not know their left and right. So they end up engaging in activities that they are not supposed to do. So my question is, is it the law or the lawyer that is supposed to be blamed for this ambiguity? Thank you very much. Maybe we'll blame the NCC. There's someone behind you. Please give the microphone to them. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Derry, a level 100 student of the University of Ghana. And I would also add up, want to add up to instilling moral values in our education system. It should also go into the university level, not necessarily at the basic level, because we are the current generation going into offices, going into um, public positions, and then we have to be instilled with the morals, and then we even go into the root, so that in the long run, we would have a circulation of morals in our society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, last two. I'll just take last two, yes. Okay, um, my name is Joseph Forsen from the University of Ghana. Well, uh, my concern is most people have grown um, familiar and comfort with and the way systems are, and thereby they don't really push up for certain things to be done. Um, we feel certain things that go on, it's, it's normal, it's, it's, it's fine, because we can just easily go away with them. But then it's, it's a major concern that I, I want it to go away. So okay. we have to um, make sure that um, there are systems in place that um, will break this comfort, this, this familiarity we've, we've had with our society. Thank you. Thank you. Please, uh, Nicholas, can you bring the microphone forward here? Yes. Uh, let's get a light. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to give me. My name is Inokwahine Labi, a student of the University of Ghana. S sorry, we can't hear you. My name is Inokwahine Labi, a student of the University of Ghana. Mm -hmm. I want to ask this simple question. Over the years, it has been recorded that the ministers, some of the ministers are not working perfectly as expected. What are the measures put in place to hold them accountable? Okay, 2016, 2020, 2024. I'm sure that's one of the checks. But thank you very much. Let's give the uh, comments from the IT. We're starting with lawyer, sir. Thank you. Um, yes, before I respond to, I think, one or two, which may be directed at me, I just want to make the general point that the citizens should not be blamed too much because, frankly, since 1992, the citizens of Ghana have been very active, hitting the streets taking uh, punches and beatings, and intervening. In fact, often demonstrations are a reflection of institutional failure. 
because if the system is working normally, nobody should be on the streets. But when people hit the streets, it's, an, it's a reflection that institutions that are designed to do what they have to do are not doing it. But since 92, we have gradually been experiencing a rather tragic uh, scenario, and that is we have voice without accountability. I think often we have mistaken the fact that we can go on the radio and say things, you can say whatever you want and nobody does anything to you. We've mistaken that to mean accountability. I'll give you a story. Um, Prussia used to be the former name of Germany. And there used to be a king of Prussia called Frederick the Great. According to history, Frederick the Great was a very short man. And they said one day he was walking the streets and he saw a lot of people gathered by a wall trying to read something. When he got there, as short as he was, he couldn't read. So he instructed that they should bring it down. When they brought the thing down for him to read, it turned out to be a very scathing attack on his government that he wasn't doing well. According to the story, he told the people to bring it down so anyone passing by can read it. Now the people were surprised because this is supposed to be a criticism, massive criticism against your government. And when he was asked why, he actually asked that they should do that. His response was, his people can say whatever they want to say about him. He can do whatever he wants to do. This is a happy scenario, a happy union. Do whatever you want, I do whatever I want. Say whatever you want, I do whatever I want. I think we may have gotten to a point over the years where our governments have become behaving, you know, they, they've come to that point where the sense of people can say whatever. So on a regular morning, the radio stations are filled with accusations and criticisms and everyone is saying whatever. But in the end, government ministers and governments go about doing their usual thing. Mm. Therefore, you can have a situation of voice without accountability. And I think that is what we've had for some time. Okay. The sense in which we can say whatever we want, but the day ends, we all go to bed. And the only time we can truly check is during elections. But even that, there are issues. Mm -hmm. I think we need to work strongly against that. And that is why I have suggested that parliament needs to reinvent itself. Parliament needs to remind itself. Because the constitution has been structured in such a way that parliament is the heartbeat of the entire constitution. Mm -hmm. In fact, parliament is the strongest of all the bodies. Parliament checks everybody, including itself. It checks the judiciary. It checks the executive. It checks the MDAs, the ministries, departments, and agencies. It checks all others in between. If parliament fails, the constitutional experiment has failed. So as much as we wish we can dance around the parliamentary problem, unfortunately we can't. Parliament has to change. Parliament has to become more effective. And until we get there, it's a regrettable scenario. But Robert Akikomi makes the point that it's a constitutional instruction to the president to appoint two thirds of his, or is it 30% of his, of more than, yes, of his ministers from parliament. And so, Already, the Constitution has uh, made the Parliament ineffective. That is true. Now, in the Constitution Review Commission's work, one of the major recommendations, and I went around the country, one of the major recommendations of people around the country was that that two-thirds majority thing should be changed. I can't remember from the report whether it was contained in there, mm. but clearly, Parliament doesn't even have the incentive to remove that. Parliament appears to be very happy with that, and that is one of the regrettable difficulties I have, mm. because Parliament sees itself as a beneficiary of that situation, but it is that situation which has crippled Parliament, because instead of Parliament becoming the destination, Parliament has become the transit point, and the where, MPs, is, uh, mm. where MPs feel their election mm. is a means to become ministers, okay. and the executive, I mean executives are smart, keep the executive juicy, keep parliament a little less than the executive, so that everyone who goes in there hopes, hopes to behave well, mm. so that by being appointed a minister, you may have arrived. All that right. is the part of the difficulties we have. And I think there was um, just one line, but there was a question on whether there's rule of law in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a very difficult question. Whether it's rule of persons or rule of, rule whether of whether political parties or rule, or rule of law. Look, in the constitutional law class, we say the rule of law means three things, that the supremacy of the law, the certainty of the law, and that there's fundamental human rights that are granted. Now let me tell you, there's no rule of law in any country where you have corruption. Because what corruption does is to undermine the application of the law. The bipartisan blind nature of the application of the law implies that all persons are subject to the law, but corruption compromises this by ensuring that some people um, have the bite of the law coming against them when they misbehave, yet others can negotiate themselves around the law. Corruption ensures that entitlements are not applied equally and that entitlements are applied on the basis of who can purchase what. Corruption ensures that things are negotiated and that people's sentiments and preferences 
are actually overruling um, in terms of the position of the law. So there can't be the rule of law in any country where there is strong corruption. And since people say in Ghana there is strong corruption, I think the legal logic is clear that there's rule of law to a point. But it's others. not absolute. Thank you very much, Kofi Abochi. Uh, Madam Josephine Nkrumah, concluding comments? I think, um, Mr. Abochi, if I may beg to differ with your, your position about you've seen accountability when collectively people have demonstrated. But I think we can all attest to the fact that in this country, at least in my lifetime, almost every demonstration has, I have seen has been on partisan basis. So it begs the question whether we are demonstrating because I'm pro this, pro or anti this party. And so you would find that most of the demonstrations has been by opposition against something that government wants to introduce. But you see, we all must begin to look at things that affect all of us collectively, devoid of partisan lens. So that when we do that, we can properly question policies and executive decisions. We're talking about the ineffectiveness of parliament today. And when you go to parliament today, almost every debate you find in parliament, it's either I'm block for this party or against this party. You would hardly see our lawmakers voting on a matter of principle or objectivity. It's because this is the way my party wants it, so this is the way I see it. And this is the way my party wants it, so I see it the other way. You don't see, you hardly see them. The only time you would find parliament coming together on issues is when it affects their pocket. That one, then you see they are all voting for the ex gratia to mm. be X amount. Mm. So you see, I think we should also now ask, who are the people that we are putting up to represent us? Are we putting up people that truly understand their role as looking out for the welfare of our constituents? Or people who are looking at transiting through parliament into the executive okay. to benefit themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Your final words, concluding remarks. So just uh, two quick ones. One, a follow-up uh, on, on this, this last point by uh, our NCC chair about the very binary nature of our public conversation, uh, MPP, MDC, and, and I, I just want to say that the, the media, unfortunately, helps to reinforce that. Uh, one of the ways in which we uh, can get an engaged citizenry is to have as many citizen voices. The media is the channel, the vehicle through which citizens' voices often get uh, articulated. And yet, you see that in every conversation we have, uh, the conversation oftentimes is just limited to these two binary voices, you know, and uh, they come there to just reenact you know, they are, they are usual lines and really not the usual opposition. I think that uh, moving forward, we need to broaden the space, expand the space for civic discourse by allowing voices of ordinary citizens mm. that are not associated with one or the other party to be heard. Uh, the, the, the young man uh, from Legon uh, expressed uh, a concern about how things that go wrong get normalized. And I think that's a very important point. That is, uh, citizen inertia, when things go wrong, when there's leadership failure, uh, it usually doesn't happen overnight. It happens incrementally, and then over time, we get used to it, right? So when I was growing up, there was very little protocol, for example. Uh, you did not get into university by protocol. You did not get into a secondary school by protocol. In his generation, it appears that I mean, when, when there was protocol, it was something illegitimate, it was through the back door. So there was protocol, I'm sure, but it was like probably 2%. These days, it's almost like there is no way you get into a public institution, 
you get into, uh, you get a public job, an ordinary public job, I'm not talking about, you know, even getting into school, and these are kids. Mm -hmm. There's no way, you know, it's, everything is now by protocol. And unfortunately, his point is very important that when we accept these things as they happen, over time they get normalized. It undermines our civic virtue, it undermines, you know, the, the, the public, you know, morality, it, it undermines a lot of the values that the chairperson spoke about in her speech. And this is a lot about values. The conversation we are having is a lot about values. What do you do in a society where most public benefits, whether it's a job, a contract, is distributed on the basis of protocol? What does that happen to hard work? What does that have, I mean, what does that do to hard work? What does that do to merit? And yet there are people toiling. What does that do to social justice? So a lot of these things, we should not let them fester until they become normal. That's why citizen engagement, citizen expression of outreach is important. We need to stand up to these things when we see them beginning to become normal, and we have to stop them. I don't know how you're going to roll back protocol, for example. It didn't happen in my days. It's the norm in your days. It's unfortunate. I have two little kids. Uh, Aunt just, uh, Auntie Joyce was reminding me, you know, are my kids going to be raised in a system where they must know somebody before they can get ahead? I don't want that to happen. Okay. Okay. But we have to speak up when these things happen. That's why I would still associate myself with the, the, the remarks made by the chair that the citizen is key in this. The citizen is really key in this. Thank you very much. But I still hope, at least, that's the assurance we've been given. And we must rise up. The Ghana Action Series would help us in case you forget. Every now and then, we'll remind you that you have some obligations as a citizen. You have some responsibilities. And we'll also remind the leadership or the elected that they are accountable. Uh, there's a comment that has come through quickly. Let me read this before we end. And it's from Samson Ladiayenin. And he says, Chiefs, what extra legal or moral power do chiefs require to mobilize social action and to ensure proper delivery of citizen duties? Insulting the president is not a crime in Ghana, but insulting a chief is a crime punishable by law. Tell the chiefs they should act without more power. That's a comment that has come through from a lawyer, something like the enemy, not me. And I wish to dissociate myself from any suits that may arise. But thank you all. Uh, I think this is where we have to end the discussion. Let me appreciate our panel this morning. Uh, Kofi Abochi, uh, former dean of the Gimpa Law School. We appreciate you for your time today. Madam Josephine Nkrumah is our guest speaker. She's chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education. Thank you. Professor H. Kwesi Prempe of CDD, thank you so much for being a panel this morning. Dr. Joyce Aye, really thank you for being the guide and the motivator for the uh, One Ghana movement. I've seen Senor Hussey around. He's disappeared. He's CEO of the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors, key member of the One Ghana movement. I thank you all, uh, the chiefs who graced the occasion, we really appreciate that you made time, the politicians who came, the students, and the ordinary man who came here to just listen to the Ghana Action Series. This is a second edition. There will be more coming up, but while you are walking out, remember that we'll be sending you emails about our right way campaign. And this time around, we are on what we call Adopt a Bean. So if you're driving through Accra and you see a rubbish bean with a flag with my name on it, uh, is because I paid for it to be put there. So when you are walking on the streets of Accra, you have litter, you don't drop it because there's no bin, but you put it in the bin that has been provided by members of One Ghana Movement. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for being a member of this morning's uh, discussion. My name is Umaru Sanda Amado. This broadcast has been live on 97.3 CTFM on, on Facebook, and it was ably supported by the NCCE, uh, CTTV, CTFM, and the One Ghana Movement. Thank you, and have a pleasant day.